Oh, yes. Good to know that you guys know that we are recording this and the recording of this panel will be available on YouTube after the event is done. So today we are here for Disclose This, Advancing Disability Awareness in Archives and Libraries, a panel and question and answer event hosted by the Archival Workers Emergency Fund Organizing Committee or all fund. And today, oh, I should let you know that this is being live captioned as Sarah and I were talking about just before a few minutes before this. You can turn on those captions. I can't tell quite where from the screen now. I think it's in the more section Then you can drop down says live transcript. Um, and the structure of this event, how it will go is that we'll start with some brief introductions and welcome our panelists here and thank them for being here. Then the panel discussion will consist of four questions and each panelist will have about two to three minutes to answer the questions. So that will set, that portion will take about 30 to 40 minutes. Then following that, we'll have about 15 minutes at the end for an open Q&A session. We encourage you to enter your questions in the chat. My colleague, Lydia Tang, is moderating the chat and will be collecting questions for that section. And to introduce myself very briefly, I am Bridget Malley. I'm one of the members of the Archival Workers Emergency Fund Organizing Committee. And I am also on the Accessibility and Disability Section Steering Committee. I'm in a little bit of an interesting setup right now because my Roger Penn streams audio to my hearing aids is currently not quite working right. So it's, I'm hooked up very closely to my laptop. Um, so if you see me fiddling around with that, that's why. So, to begin, I would like to introduce Jasmine Clark, who is the Digital Scholarship Librarian at Temple University. Her primary areas of research are accessibility and metadata in emerging technology and emerging technology centers. Currently, she is co-leading the Virtual Block Sun, a project to recreate the Charles L. Block Sun Afro-American collection in virtual reality, while also doing research in 3D metadata and the development of Section 508 compliant guidelines for virtual reality experiences. She is also the chair of the DLF Digital Accessibility Working Group, as well as a co-chair of the DLF Committee for, for Equity and Inclusion. Joining us today, we also have Michelle Gans, who is the Archives Director for McDonough Innovation and has been an archivist for 13 years. She received her MLIS from the University of Arizona and her BA in Humanities from the Ohio State University. Over the course of her career, she has been a passionate advocate for disabled and marginalized voices. She served on the Joint Archives Management and Records Management Task Force to draft the original best practices for accessible archives for people with disabilities and currently serves as chair of the Society of American Archivists Accessibility and Disability Section. Gans is a recipient of the 2020 SAA Spotlight Award. And we have Karina Hagelin with us today as well. They are a disabled, genderqueer, femme artist, librarian, and community organizer based in Ithaca, New York. Most recently, they served as an outreach and instruction librarian, diversity fellow at Cornell University, and as a first year academic librarian blogger for the Association of College and Research Libraries. Karina has a BA in American Studies, a certificate in LGBT Studies, and an MLIS, all from the University of Maryland College Park. Their research interests and expertise includes trauma-informed librarianship, feminist pedagogy, critical librarianship, disability justice, instruction, and zines. Karina is involved with ACRL New York, the Kriplev community, and serves, as, serves on the editorial board for the Journal of Disability in Libraries. They also run a small press, Femme Filth Press, where they create and publish zines about trauma recovery, healing as resistance, queer femme joy, radical self-love and vulnerability, and mental health. More about their work can be found at karinakilljoy.com. I do want to put in a brief plug for the hashtag CripLib community on Twitter. They are excellent. In our questions, we are going to begin with Jasmine, if that's all right. And we will be going through the questions in a rotating order of the panelists uh, alphabetically by last name. 
And so our first question is, what, if any, are some difficulties you've had when discussing disability in the workplace? Jasmine? Hi. Um, the first thing I'm going to say, and I think the biggest thing has um, a lot of a lack of a lack of awareness um, and a certain degree of ignorance around disability. Um, I think anybody who is familiar with disability knows this, but disability is one of those like last boundary where it, it, it's still considered okay to say really messed up things, right? You know, unless you're an absolutely horrible person, you acknowledge racism is wrong, but people think it's common sense that because you have a disability, you should you can't be treated. Like obviously you shouldn't have certain rights or obviously you shouldn't be, it, that's still considered okay to say. Um, and so you come across this barrier of educating people and trying to get them to kind of, from a disability rights standpoint, recognize that people with disabilities are exactly the same as everyone else. They have their own desires and their own lived experiences and those lived experiences are just as valid as anyone else's. Um, so like affirming that humanity, but that, uh, that can't be done without educating people about, you know, the different, and disability is so broad. So you spend a lot of time um, just foregrounding people in disability. Um, so discussing it is, is, you just have to be prepared for a lot of microaggressions, a lot of problems, a lot of overt aggressions, you know, um, some eugenics maybe sprinkled in there more than you would like to hear. Um, so um, ignorance around disability is a big one. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And Michelle, same question for you. Michelle, it looks like uh, you're currently muted. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, as I was saying, um, I just wanted to follow up on what Jasmine was saying that, you know, there's a lot of ignorance around disability. And my biggest issue is because I sound like I speak really well, I'm clearly not actually deaf. I've had people argue with me. I've had people tell me that it's my problem that I need to deal with. I've had, um, it's, it's difficult because it ends up putting the onus of responsibility on the disabled person, not the people you're talking to. And so you, at least I fall into this trap of apologizing for things that I should not be apologizing for because there's, there, it's not a fixable thing. It's just a thing, you know? And so, um, Honestly, I have a lot of hard time not getting angry in these conversations, especially when I've had them over and over and over again. If I've worked with you for eight years and you still can't remember that I'm hard of hearing, that's your problem, not mine. And I get angry about it. And then I become the angry brown woman that, you know, gives them the, the reason to not listen to anything else that I say. <laughs> Absolutely. And Karina? Yeah, so I think a lot of us haven't had much practice sitting with our discomfort, and that extends to our conversations around disability. Um, I think people often want to like fix me uh, as if I'm even fixable because they aren't able to sit with their discomfort um, and how ableism impacts their worldviews and relationships. One of the things I get really stressed out about is when people ask me like, how are you today? Like I'm chronically ill and crazy and disabled and being expected to be like, good, great, everything's great, when like I'm going through chemo is really, really difficult. Um, so this expectation to perform sanity, to perform able-bodiedness, to perform like non-disabledness is really stifling and isolating for those of us who are disabled or crazy or chronically ill or sick. Um, and as librarians, I especially think we're expected to put on this shining face um, for our patrons and colleagues rather than like cause them discomfort by forcing them to like sit with their feelings for five seconds. And this is like prioritizing their feelings over like our actual lives and experiences, um, creating like a culture of really silencing and fear and stigma. And that is what I find especially frustrating is being asked, how are you? And then the like, the expectation to just perform able-bodiedness and like non-disabledness Mm -hmm. Absolutely makes sense. So uh, the takeaways I'm just taking in from this is having to constantly educate your coworkers, also having to um, navigate a workplace that is not necessarily built for the kind of conversations that we would like to 
have and also the conversation we would like to not have, if that makes sense. In any case, I'm gonna to move to the next question that we have and Michelle, you will be up first for this. So what does an inclusive workplace look like? How can managers and peers be supportive and act as change makers in their organizations? So for me, an inclusive workplace is one where you don't have to ask for an accommodation. They are available. They are, they are accessible through any number of portals that don't require me physically walking over to someone and going, please, sir, may I have another? You know, it, it's just available. I want to see things like screen readers and cones of silence, you know, rooms where I, someone can sit and be loud if they need to when they're on a, a phone call. A room where you can go and sit quietly for five minutes and decompress, you know, a, 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 a sensory pod, if you will. These sorts of things, they can be available because you know what, we all have coffee pots in our offices. We all have space to pray if we need it. We have space for all these other things that people need. And oftentimes, accessibility is at the bottom of the list. And the idea seems to be, well, as long as we don't have someone who is vocally disabled here, we don't need to provide that. So thinking ahead and saying, let's provide all of these things. Let's provide step stools for short people. Let's find grabbers for people who can't reach things on top shelves. If it's all already there, then I don't have to ask you for it. And I don't have to feel embarrassed about asking. Mm -hmm. So you see inclusion and inclusive workplace and accommodations as being very closely linked? Yes. And and honestly, to be more supportive, able-bodied people need to say, hey, how come we don't have a step stool here? How come we don't have a place where someone can be quiet? You know, how come there isn't a place? Start asking those questions because if other people ask them too, then all of a sudden people go, huh, five different people have asked about this. Maybe we should follow up on it. So use your voice. A really good point yes and Karina you as well what does an inclusive workplace look, for you, look like to you yeah don't expect disabled and otherwise marginalized people to do all the work this is all of our jobs um one way that you can like stay informed by the conversations we're having is by following the CripLib hashtag on Twitter which has some really great conversations by uh disabled library and information science workers I think as a community, we need to be more intentional, authentic, and supportive of ourselves and our colleagues and comrades by centering principles like radical empathy and radical vulnerability, um, being able to bring our whole selves to work without fear from repercussion uh, from colleagues, supervisors, or and HR. Um, changing our language, don't use ableist slurs. Uh, Lydia XZ Brown of Autistic Hoya has a really great blog post on ableism and language. And then like uh, Michelle was saying, by be creating inclusive and safe workplaces by offering things like sensory rooms, quiet rooms, like places like making that built environment inclusive too. Um, one of the things that I really loved at Cornell was my supervisor knew I had PTSD and a cubicle was like not going to be potentially a great choice for me. Um, so she actually offered to like switch her office with my cubicle while I was there. And I was like, wow, that is like how you like do it. Uh, <laughs> that's amazing. Uh, and then also like knowing both the local and national resources. I think this is especially important as we're like we don't know who else in our workplace is a survivor, uh, our patrons who might come to us needing uh, resources, but to know those resources like warm lines, hotline, crisis centers and shelters, and to especially be familiar with them, those that don't rely on police, like no cops, cops out of our libraries. Mm -hmm. And Jasmine? Um, something I, I'm thinking a lot about right now, particularly as I think about um, how to better integrate disabled student workers into a digital scholarship space um, is normalizing accommodation to begin with. I don't think uh, most people realize just how unaccommodating we are. So think about it, even someone who's not disabled goes to a restaurant, somebody makes a mistake and they feel uncomfortable. You know, they, they do mental gymnastics trying to figure out how to address the fact that the mistake was made, right? And then when you get into things that as Karina pointed out earlier, um, make people uncomfortable, like truly, you know, intimate or what is, we're, we're conditioned to see as intimate or inappropriate um, 
things come to light, people shut down and it becomes impossible for disabled people to ask for an accommodation. So what is difficult for an able person to ask for becomes impossible for a disabled person to get access to, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, I'm thinking from a structural standpoint and saying that we need to also normalize um, actually asking people and giving people um, the role of as advisor on their own job position, on their own job descriptions um, and on what they need in their workspace. Oftentimes in libraries and archives, we focus so much on user-centered design for users, for you know patrons, but we don't think about staff. And we also, when we hire, you know, we've, we've, if, if you follow the disability kind of conversation at MLIS, uh, information orgs, you hear like, you know, don't say 50 pounds, you know, must be able to lift 50 pounds for a job that doesn't require you to lift 50 pounds. But even beyond that, um, things like, hey, this is a job description we have. Would this work for you? What would you need? Like long as you're, well, don't finalize that job description until you've talked to some disabled people or you've brought in some people, you've paid, you've paid some people to kind of, um, sit down and advise you on the position and say, you know, what in this position, how could we build in flexibility? How could we make this something that some that someone wouldn't have to ask for accommodation or the accommodation is very easy to ask for, you know? So I, I don't think, I think in an ideal world, right? We'd be more and more inclusive, but right now where we are right now, accommodations are gonna be a reality. Let's make it easy and comfortable mm -hmm. um, for people to ask for accommodations and to receive even more follow to follow through <laughs> and receive those accommodations, right? Um, Bridget? Yes. If I could interject for just one second, um, sorry for the interruption, but I think we've had a couple of comments. Um, if it's possible for the speakers to talk a little bit more slowly, um, that might be helpful in terms of the captioning functioning more the way it's supposed to. Absolutely, thank you, Sarah. Okay. Um, one comment I just wanted to make with regards to what Jasmine was saying is um, I'm thinking now of ways that workplaces can create an environment of trust, but not in necessarily an abstract way, but doing that by putting authority back into the hands, well, giving autonomy and authority to workers at every step of the job path from the beginning through to throughout your career. Okay, I'll be thinking about that. Now, our next question. Um, Michelle, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that the one issue I tend to have with how this works now is it requires that I disclose all of the things that I need, why I need accessibility. Mm -hmm. And so if we can figure out a way to take that out of the equation, I shouldn't have to explain what's going on with me for, to every single person I need to ask. And I cannot imagine if you have PTSD, having to relive that trauma 30 times while you ask people for things, who wants to do that? <laughs> Absolutely. We do have a question about disclosure coming up in two slides, I believe. But in any case, our next question is, Karina will be fielding this first. How can people with and people without disabilities advocate for disability awareness and representation in archives and libraries for ourselves and for others? Some of this has been touched on, but if you have further thoughts. Yeah, I would love to get us to go beyond awareness and representation to advocacy, liberation, and justice. I think a large part of this can be achieved through building cross-community coalitions and solidarity with other workers in our field who experience uh, the really aggressive like violence of a lot of LIS workplaces uh, in not the exact same ways as ours, but like in similar ways or overlapping ways. I would really like to see uh, as workers to commit to creating a culture that celebrates radical vulnerability, compassion, and empathy, a culture that allows folks to bring their whole and authentic selves to work um, and by showing up for each other. I think sometimes people are really afraid to do it wrong, so they don't do it at all, uh, but showing up is what's important like letting your colleagues know that they're not alone, that you see them and that they're someone you can go to and trust and know that they're doing so from a genuine place of care and concern. Um, other things that uh, might be good uh, starting points are trainings on mental health first aid, 
speaking to local survivor support organizations or the counseling center about how to best support colleagues um, if we're feeling nervous about our skills to do so. And um, just like encouraging everyone to go to these because we can always brush up on our skills. I just also wanna say that I'm really, really grateful for the colleagues and comrades who have supported me in bringing my whole self to work. Um, they've made that a possibility for me and I want to pay their uh, kindness and solidarity forward by trying to cultivate a similar culture wherever I go. That's wonderful, I like that. And next we have Jasmine. Um, so something I really wanna emphasize is that it's two points. Um, one, when people hear the word advocacy, I don't know that the average person, unless you come from, you grew up in a marginalized space where you had to advocate for your whole, yourself your whole life, really understand the risks and realities that advocacy come with. Um, I think they think it's just, you know, I spoke up and then nothing happens. It's no advocacy is retaliation. Advocacy is hostility. Advocacy is a lot of things that come with that. And I really say this in a compassionate way because like Karina, I've had really wonderful, compassionate colleagues. Um, and I want to also put the onus back on organizations. So often organizations say they want, you know, their, or their workers, um, their staff, their stakeholders to speak up, but they don't have a culture of accountability. They don't have a cult, an advocacy-based culture. They don't have a culture where you can be honest and, and where um, accommodations or even basic requests could even be respected on a most basic level. Um, I think that a lot of organizations don't want to acknowledge that because a lot of information organizations are in a scarcity culture, where they're increasingly being, if there's a demand to um, validate their, to show their value all the time, um, that they spend so much time dealing with resources being cut, being there at least, you know, we, anybody who works in LIS will tell you, you know, we've all been in positions where we're doing three jobs, right? They tried to slyly splice three jobs together because the organization is poorly funded. And in that environment, advocacy doesn't work well, right? You've got administrators who are under pressure. They don't want to pay for additional accommodations. They don't want to do things well. Um, and then they will sit down and put the onus on marginalized people or even their colleagues to say, hey, if there's a problem, tell us without acknowledging that they can't do it. They're not, they have no intention or no capability to do anything about it, right? Um, and so my, my point is to say that in, when we talk about, you know, how can you be an advocate, just one, be aware that, of what advocacy is and two, um, being fair to ourselves and to our colleagues and understanding that sometimes it's just, there's no winning that leap. Sometimes it's just, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. it, it's a, it's a lose-lose situation, unfortunately. Um, and sometimes nobody's to blame. No one person is to blame. It's a structural organization problem, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, about what you can and can't take on yourself. Like we can't all do build those skills that Karina was talking about and actively go out of our way to say, hey, I want to make sure I'm prepared to support my colleagues when the time comes, but we can't necessarily always be all the change that we want to be in a given environment. I don't want people to beat themselves up for it. I've seen a lot of people mm -hmm. who attempt it, it fails, and then they feel as though they've done something wrong and they didn't do anything wrong. And they feel like they can't advocate anymore. And, and it, I, I want to disavow people of that idea. Yeah. A very good point. Very heartbreaking, but very good point. Um, and Michelle, you are last on the docket for this question. So I tend to take a more subversive approach to this and do things kind of where I model the behavior I want to see. So I treat everyone the same. I ask everyone if they need this, that, or the other thing. And I call out things when I see them. The biggest one for me is when people say, I'm so OCD about having my files all organized. And I will immediately stop them in their tracks and say, hey, that just means you're a professional. Let's not use language then I'll say something like, you know, OCD is a debilitating disease, not some, it's not a joke and it's not, it's not how we do our jobs. If you like your order files being organized, it's because you're a professional own that and don't, don't turn it into a joke. And I've noticed that women, people who, who identify as women tend to fall back on that 
you know, apologizing sort of mode and taking it upon ourselves and, and, and guys don't do that as much. So I tend to try to do that as well. I try to say, you know, I've stopped apologizing for things and I've uh, stopped asking. I've, I've started saying, hey, that's not right. Let's do this instead. And then take away the other option. But I am also comfortable with being the angry brown woman. I'm, I'm comfortable with people being mad at me. I'm comfortable with people not liking me. But because of that, I am also willing to go further out on a limb for somebody else that, that is not in a space where they can do that. So I'm willing to take risks that other people aren't because I know that not everybody is willing to put themselves in the firing line every single time. I don't care, so I'll, I'll do it every time and I don't mind that. But recognizing that many people do not feel comfortable talking about themselves in that intimate of a detail, you know? So, so recognizing that language means things and what you say matters and how you react to things matters. You know, those, those double takes are more insulting than anything else that you could possibly say. If, you know, if you all of a sudden see my hearing aid, I'd really rather you just ignore it than, you know, do a big, <laughs> um, I do want to potentially put you on the spot, Michelle, um, Michelle just about the, because you, you're talking about learning and teaching yourself sort of not to apologize, um, because I know you and I both, we both wear hearing aids. Um, that's the area we come from. Are, are there any specific instances you've had where you sort of consciously decided, okay, with regards to hearing loss, I'm going to not apologize? when I ask people to repeat themselves, I need to stop saying, sorry, can you repeat that? I've been working on, pardon me, I didn't, can, pardon me? And using visual cues instead of, and in fact, my therapist actually told me to, to do this one. Make a big deal about taking the hearing aid, hold on a second, and make a really big deal about putting it back in. That's what she does. Um, I'm not quite that comfortable taking mine out all the time, but I do do a thing where I'll pull my hair back and kind of pop them up on top of my ears. So little visual things that keep me from saying sorry. I have also had my, my core team of people that I trust who, who will remind me when I say sorry for something They go, Hey, you're not supposed to do that anymore. And it's a visual, it, it like they'll actually do this and it's helping me notice when I do that, but it's, it's work. Honestly, it's, it's homework that I gave myself from therapy that says, I'm going to practice doing this this week. And that works for me, but it may not be comfortable for you to do that sort of thing. So my suggestion is Pick your battles, find the things that you are, you're okay with just letting go of. And, and those things that just will keep you up at night, those are the ones you fight for. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, thank you. All right, and our final question is, do you have advice for navigating the archives and libraries field as a disabled person? In particular, is, do you have any advice specifically for disclosure? And Jasmine, you are first at bat. So coming from the place of invisible disability and mental health, um, I'm going to speak and just say for me personally, um, disclosure is very much of this special equation of um, is, and I guess the best, the just to say the consequences, right? I've had scenarios where I've disclosed and then someone or a supervisor or a colleague who has previously never attributed my behavior to a diagnosis suddenly brings up that everything must be because of X, Y, and Z. So you're moody today because obviously this or this. And I'm like, no, it's because you're, you're a jerk. Um, you know, I don't have to be disabled for that, you know. Um, and um, <laughs> anybody who knows me personally will tell you I'm very quick. <laughs> As, like I said, if you've been advocating for yourself your whole life, you kind of, you, maybe you have a little bite to you, right? Um, and so um, when it comes to disclosure, something I personally prefer to not ever, if I don't have to, I think that's common, right? But um, when you do think about it, I also always have to think about, um, am I prepared? Like, what am I going to do if this person starts trying to use this, like weaponizes this against me? And um, 
are there other ways? Can I alter my workflow in subtle ways? Can I be flexible in other ways that will allow me to function without it ever, I, I, without ever having to address it, right? And it's not even just accommodation, but I've had to learn alternative workflows for myself. I've had to learn how I've worked. Like I know that I have periods of hyper-focus and then periods where I can't do anything. And that has bad optics, right? When you are super productive and finish all of your work in an hour, but then you can't do anything for the next three hours, you know, and you're like floating at work. And how do I, what what can I do to like work around that or prevent that from becoming an issue? And I, I think that's just practice. Um, and I think that I've found workarounds by not explicitly stating why I do that. So I've said to my supervisor, I've said, hey, you know, I'll say I've finished all of my work right now. So I'm gonna take the next, you know, I'm gonna do light activities or lighter things here or here or, or you know. Um, so I've never disclosed why. I've just tried to explain so that way I don't get questions as to like why I'm taking it easy, quote unquote. I'm not, but I'm like mentally recovering. You're doing what you can, right, yeah. <laughs> um, and so I, I do think it's a complex, like I, I absolutely, if you've never disclosed before in a work environment and had that weaponized against you, I always try to warn people who have um, mental health and invisible disabilities about that immediately. I'm like, if you've never had it, it's jarring. Because in every case that that's happened to me, the person was very supportive in the beginning, right? They were maybe too supportive. <laughs> and then out of nowhere, they throw it at you, they throw it in your face and it becomes something you never let go of, right? And I, I, I'm sorry to be the Debbie Downer of the panel. <laughs> consistently but I try to set realistic expectations in that area and say that that's that's just super common um especially with mental health diagnoses when it's stigmatized or the person's just a jerk there's nothing you can do about that it is interesting I don't think I'd ever really considered um because disability in general still like very much has a stigma to it but the specific differences with regards to disclosure between invisible disabilities and more visible ones like my hearing aids are plainly visible, but I can't think of any situation necessarily where for me, someone weaponized that. So that's a new perspective that I was unaware of. And Michelle, you are up next. So this is kind of a downer answer as well, because there's, that's just how this works. You have to learn to recognize when to not disclose because there are times where you can just tell it's going to make everything worse it's going to make everything more complicated and it's easier to just figure it out on your own but the key is to figure out when to do that because you can't do it all the time it's unsustainable trust me i tried for 35 years i didn't wear hearing aids I didn't tell anyone I was hard of hearing. I just figured it out on my own. I'm severely hard of hearing. I can't hear anything when people are talking. And I just figured it out, which was ridiculous and almost killed me. So it's that whole pick your battles thing. And I think for me, and I think Jasmine, you might have this too, is for me, my disability and the racial issues are all intertwined together. So a lot of times, I'll have to stop and go, am I reacting to someone being ableist or am I reacting to somebody being racist? Because the reactions to those are different. I will immediately go to DEFCON 11 if you're being racist to me. However, I'm going to be a lot nicer to you if you don't realize I have a disability and you're clearly just incorrect, not trying to be, you know. So, so and this comes with experience. So I've been dealing with this for 44 years. I'm way better at it than someone who's been dealing with it for 44 minutes, you know? So cut yourself some slack and recognize that it's, this is not an instantaneous, I have my diagnosis of my disability and now I'm gonna move forward like nothing's going on. You know, there, there are steps that you have to take to make it okay for yourself before you can start dealing with other people. So my best advice, find a mentor, find someone who has this, at least one of the same disabilities that you do, who's been in the field longer, who can help you talk about ways to approach different things. I, for example, have this cute little story that I tell people about why I'm brown and a cute little story I tell them about why I'm hard of hearing. And 
people have been offended on my behalf when I have to tell that story. But then when they've said something afterwards, I'm like, look, man, I've done this 3,000 times. I'm going to do another 8,000 times in the next month. I'm not offended, Maya, but I appreciate that you are. Tell other people why that was wrong. And that's the biggest thing. When you run into someone who has any indication of possibly being an ally, tell them what to do. Because people want to help, they want to do the right thing, but if you didn't even know that this was a thing that existed until three days ago, I can't expect you to instantly be, you know, an expert on how to advocate for other people. But um, I'm going to be honest, libraries and archives, they tend to be run by really rude people who will just say, things that you're like, man, if you said that to me in any other situation, I would draw my jaw and just walk away. And you have to recognize that they are the person in charge. So you can't flip them the bird like you want to, but you can be a little passive aggressive. And I, I hate being passive aggressive. I really prefer to be very direct, but I have found that being passive aggressive sometimes works better than being aggressive aggressive. So find what works for you. Recognize that you're going to run into micro and macro aggressions. Learn how to deal with that internally because that will be the easiest way for you to deal with it externally. Um, sorry, and really quickly, I want to just, this is actually really important. I'm glad Michelle brought it up. The racial intersections for myself, mm -hmm. um, that's American history as well. Um, it is super common for Anglo cultures to say anything that breaks civility norms is a mental illness. So enslaved people wanting to run away was a mental diagnosis, not the result of them wanting to have human rights, right? Um, that's historical and that's very accurate. And I will say that that's, a, if you're disclosing as a person of color and I'll say as a black woman, um, aggression being, I'm extremely direct um, when it comes to, I'm, I'm the queen of catch me outside or I'll come to your office or you'll get a phone call if your tone is off. Um, to very politely, not in a rude way, but let you know that if you wanna be passive aggressive, I, I'll just show up <laughs> and clarify what the problem is. I'm happy to say, hey, you know, there seemed to be a misunderstanding. Would you mind do you talk about it? Is there a problem? Mm -hmm. And think twice before you are passive aggressive for no reason. <laughs> um, and there, if you can imagine, you know, I mean, you you have misogynistic jokes, right? Oh, it's that time of the month, but with mental illness or with, with any kind of disability, it becomes, very, you have to be careful who you disclose to for that reason, particularly if you were, and I will speak as a black woman, right? We're that aggressive black woman, but any a person of color in general, um, if you're direct, it's even, it's, you have to think long-term. So even if they're friendly when you're civil, um, you have to account for how they're gonna weaponize it against you when you're not, when you no longer can maintain stability. And that is very, very true. Um, I have had an experience where I had told someone repeatedly that I am hard of hearing and my phone, when I take a phone call, it beams directly into my hearing aid. So I hold my phone like this. It looks like I'm on speakerphone, but I'm not. And someone told me that that's a problem and they're going to need me to do this because it looks weird. And I lost my mind and I yelled at them and I got in trouble at work and I didn't care because I was like, you know what? Screw you and your ableist attitude. But that's hard to do. And, you know, when I got home, I was really upset. I had to vent to my best friend for an hour and a half and I cried for a little while. And that's an important part of it too. You have to recognize that this stuff does affect you. Nobody is made of steel. None of this bounces off of any of us, no matter how long we've done it. So recognize that you may leave work one day emotionally drained because you argued with your supervisor about something logical, like, well, can't we just have a chair that goes up and down so that, you know, different people can sit in the same chair? And they're like, no, we have to use these stable, you know, you know that you're going to walk away from that frustrated and annoyed. So find like I do meditation and deep muscle relaxation and like I have an hour and a half thing that I do every single day to ensure that when I get into bed I don't think about these things all night long. <laughs> all right and then Karina we have you. Oh, thank you so much, Jasmine and Michelle, for your vulnerability and your really valuable um, insights. The only thing that I would really add is to like find and build a community and like be 
trust your gut because people will absolutely weaponize your uh, diagnoses against you. So like really uh, trust your intuition about people because usually like my body knows before like my head necessarily knows. And the other thing is to just document everything. Um, I like keep a spreadsheet of microaggressions, like macroaggressions, like what's going on, when it happened, um, and then get it in writing. Like don't, if someone, if you know you're about to go to a meeting and someone's gonna be like, say something really ableist and like messed up to you, um, check in after the meeting, be like, so I just wanna check in and get make sure that I got this right. So that you have it in writing because they will absolutely like use your diagnosis to like discount your experiences, even though they absolutely did that. Um, so yeah, be prepared and be really strategic is what I would suggest. Also, we bring up your cat in the background. Wonderful. All right. And next we have our open Q&A session. I do not currently have a chat open, so I cannot tell what all questions we've been receiving. Lydia, what do you have up on for well, us? I, if, if people have any questions, please feel free to add them into the chat or what you can also do is uh, raise your hand. Uh, I'm not particularly well versed in how to do this necessarily, but I think if you go to the participants list, then you can do some sort of reaction that way. Um, let's see here. Uh, there's a comment from ADW. Thank you so much for a great conversation. Would like to hear from panelists about any experiences they have had with workplace organizing and collective action, which unlike advocacy doesn't allow institutions to put the onus on individuals. I'm happy to speak to that or are we going in order again? Sorry. I think whoever speaks up first as we go will work. So go ahead, Jasmine. Um, first, I want to apologize. I'm a very naturally fast speaker, so I, my version of slow is probably still very fast. I apologize. I'm trying to be more conscious of it. Um, so one, I do try to stay involved with my union, but um, unions can also be run by people who maybe aren't as um, a sympathetic or understanding as well. I won't say that about my union. I love my union. But um, I will actually give an example of doing so from a staff. Like, I am going to be the leader. It's who I am, <laughs> at least in certain things. I will say if, I, if something's not being done, I'll just do it myself. That's my personality. And so um, when I started in my department, um, I'm the digital scholarship librarian. I was a resident, li I was a resident librarian at the time. Um, disability was not something we were actively thinking about. And that was a no-no. Um, <laughs> Uh, I actually started all of my research because I came into the space and was just like, so what are we doing, you know, to ensure that disabled people will be able to use our resources and it was like crickets and I was like, mm, no, well, I got to, I have to do it now, I guess it's, I've been called, I don't know. Um, and one of the biggest things that I did in terms of pushing for collective change or pushing us uh, for us as, as a department was to begin with my coworkers um, in my department. I said, we are all going to step our game up. You are going to know the statistics. You're going to know that 20 something percent of Americans are disabled. You're going to understand, you know, the crawl up the Washington steps. You're going to know how ADA happens. You're going to know about the sit-ins in the 70s. You're going to know about all these things. You're going to, we're going to make sure that you are all well-versed as well as in race and other issues, right? I'm a DEI person. So I was like, we're coming, this department is going to get in shape. Um, but what it resulted in was when I started advocating for accessibility in my department, I don't do that by myself. And oftentimes now other people push for it. And so when I pushed for certain changes, or programs to be developed within my department, it was my whole department pushing. You know, when, um, as Michelle said, it wasn't always me, right? I One time I was sitting in my office and I have like a very proud mommy disability activist moment where a colleague came in and was like, we have a problem. And I was thinking it was like, you know, technology had gone down. He was like, this isn't accessible. It's a touch screen. What are we gonna do? And I was like, oh, this is beautiful. This is, this is a beautiful moment. You know, and so I think that when we talk about collective action, sometimes we want to wait for other people to do it. And I, I want to remind everybody here that while advocacy is hard, you can do it right. You can be the collect, you can initiate collective action. You can push your colleagues that if you have good colleagues who legitimately want to learn, you can help facilitate that and, and expect collective education, right? Like my, I, 
my one coworker now sends me accessible video games. He's like, hey, did you see this new review of the new Spider-Man game on PS4? You should see this. And he's like, you know, and he sends it to everybody. And so now we're all up on, on this kind of same page. And so um, collective action can be from your union. It can be from an official standpoint, but I wanna really um, encourage everybody here to think about that starting with you and starting with the people around you as well from grassroots. Yes. Michelle, Karina, any thoughts on this? If not, that's fine. Um, from a labor organizing background as like a student and grad student, I guess that's still a student. Um, but I think it's really important, something I would like to see uh, libraries embrace more of. I know there are a lot of great toolkits around there, uh, out there about collective organizing and action. And there's one, a really great one just came out about precarious labor, which I think affects so many disabled LIS workers, um, which I will find and put in the chat. But that is a really great question and something I really appreciate. Michelle, anything? I wish we had a union for all of us. Um, I, I actually have nothing to add here. That's all right. Um, Lydia, do we have further questions in the chat? Yes, plenty more have come in. Uh, so Thanks the next you. one from Nick says, how do you apply for a job when you know you will need accommodations, especially in work hours and environmental needs, et cetera? But I do have a lot to say about this one. <laughs> um, you have to do it incrementally. So I never disclose at the first interview, unless I am concerned it's going to be an issue. And I have found that since the first interview is almost always by phone, it's not an issue because everybody's going, can you repeat that? I, I didn't hear that, you know, so it's, so I tend to not say anything, but I developed a sense for when you can tell that it's going to go over well and when it won't. And that comes from the research I do before I have the interview. I go to a website and I look and I see, do they talk about accessibility? Do they talk about, you know, inclusion and diversity? Is it more than just talk? Because if they just have a website that says we have a DEI department, but nothing else, and I see that they haven't posted anything in a year and a half, then I know that they're not going to be friendly to accessibility. And therefore I wait until I'm further along in the process. And usually I say something when I'm there in person, especially if I have to do a uh, uh, a lecture where people are going to ask me questions because I know that somebody's going to have a really quiet voice and I'm going to need someone else to say something. So at that point, when I do my little introduction, I'm like, oh, and by the way, I'm hard of hearing, so I may need someone else to repeat a question for me, or you may need to get a little bit closer and then just move on. And don't, I don't make a big deal out of it, but it really, it depends on where you're applying, you know? And I hate to say that because we'd like to think that every institution is welcome, welcoming to, you know, non-abled non people, but that's not the case. And you can tell right away, you know, if they have a second floor and they don't have an elevator, maybe you don't want to work there. Jasmine, Karina? So I always start from the standpoint of, and this goes back to an organization may want to have an inclusive attitude, but may be incapable. Um, I do my research on the state of the organization as a whole. Do they have funding? Have they been doing layoffs? You know, sometimes I, one a major red flag is if I look at a position and I'm like, this is clearly three positions in one. You don't have the money to hire people. So you therefore do not have the money to provide accommodations or like that's a red flag, obviously. But to me, that's a, ma a major red flag. Um, and also, as Michelle pointed out, it is a gradual process if you're going to disclose. Um, because I've developed a very specific set of workflow criteria based around my kind of needs, um, I do, for example, I really prefer to either be in a space where everybody's pretty laid back and like takes walks every once in a while, or I need a private office where somebody's not hovering over me and micromanaging, you know, based on appearances. Um, and so I do tend to see, you know, can I see the building? Um, I think the hard answer is just sometimes you're just not going to be able to work someplace. It might be ideal, it might be great, but the benefits package isn't good and your insurance is you need, if you are disabled, there's a good chance you need good insurance. Um, but you usually can gauge that from looking at a bill, at, a, at an organization's budget and um, fiscal practices, right? Do, do they actually invest money in their staff? Do you have professional funding? Um, do, have there been layoffs? Um, you know, 
if you're talking about higher ed, <laughs> you know, we're talking, there's, there's a lot of factors that go into it. So during the interview, I think some, I know a lot of new librarians or new people who skimp on learning about the organization as a whole. And I think that you should avoid that because it'll tell you a lot. I agree with all the suggestions that Jasmine and Michelle have already made. Another thing is like having a community and building that is really important. So even if I don't know another disabled library worker or librarian who's employed at the institution where I'm interviewing, I know someone who works there who can connect me with someone who is disabled and works there. Um, so having kind of like a network and community to connect you to people who actually know what it's like to be there has been really, really helpful in informing my decisions about how to move forward with interviews, uh, if I actually do wanna work in this place and invest like moving in everything and upholding my life. So I think just build community is really important. Do you have any suggestions for how to get involved with the, that community? I think personally, like I am an extrovert, so it comes a little more easily. And then like being involved as a labor organizer really helped me learn how to talk to people too. Um, but the Cripple hashtag, if you're on Twitter, is a great place to start. And just like reach out to people, ask questions, be interested, um, and keep it like genuine. Like connections can be like lifesavers, honestly. Um, and yeah, I could talk about this forever, but I won't. <laughs> All right. But yeah, next question. Um, actually, can I just follow up on oh, that? Go one? ahead. Yeah. Um, one thing I do in reverse is if I know someone needs an accommodation, but they are not comfortable speaking of, I will go to them and have private conversations with people that I can tell are struggling and say, hey, you look like you need, you know, do you need some help with this? And, you know, I ask questions and then try to help guide people to the information that they need because if you were just diagnosed with something, you're dealing with the diagnosis, the treatment, if there is one, the, your family or, you know, your personal life, your work life, and, you know, trying to figure out how to ask for things. So, so I'm really active on the listservs and things. And if someone asks a question and nobody responds, I will be the first person to respond to it. And I usually do it privately because, you know, it's hard to talk about this. Not everybody is excited about it as we are. Mm. And um, I've been emailing people on the chat, but I'm just gonna go ahead and say this. Email me, michelle.gans42 at gmail. I will answer any question you have. If I don't have the answer, I will find someone who does. So, and I will never ever be mean to you about anything. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. Uh, but yeah, do we have? Further questions? We have a lot of other questions. In fact, it's it, since we're approaching the end of the hour, I'm a little unsure how to proceed here. So, uh, so we do have seven minutes left. Um, is are we going to plan to uh, collect the additional questions and then provide a blog post or something, or um, any thoughts on how to proceed? Should we continue on past the hour a little bit? I think um, gathering the questions is a good idea and I can talk with the panelists afterwards. I can shoot you all an email and see what your thoughts are on this. But in the meantime, I say go ahead with what questions we have um, up until the hour and then we encourage all the participants who are here today to connect with everyone on whatever various platforms that are, that are out there. So, okay. Uh, so uh, this question is uh, from Maggie. Do you have suggestions for people with chronic conditions that do not yet have a formal diagnosis? Or just in broadly, uh, uh, do you have advice for people who are seeking a diagnosis and haven't officially received an official one perhaps? I can speak to that. Um, throughout undergrad, I was really, really sick and really bad condition. Um, on top of the PTSD, I just like got really bad pain, got bad fatigue. Um, and it took years and years and years to get doctors to believe anything was going on with me because like they saw like a femme person. So obviously it was just like my PTSD and being psychosomatic. Um, but I had lupus and now I'm like dealing with all the immunosuppressants and all that fun stuff. But um, it's a really difficult process. And I feel like a lot of people, when they talk about disability in the workplace, they don't consider that many people struggle with finding a diagnosis or answers. They 
we spend like years of our life trying to find like what's going on with us and our bodies and it's exhausting. And I just, I wish I had more practical tips around it. Um, I'm happy to talk over email with anyone who wants to like needs help navigating that process. But that's something we really need to really consider not just for our students, but like for staffs and ourselves and workers, um, because it is such an exhausting and frustrating and just really difficult process. And I just want to acknowledge that. Thank you. And to follow up on that, my recommendation in those sorts of situations is to find an ally, find someone that you can trust, that you can talk to and say, hey, here's what's going on with me. Can we look at making the whole office more accepting of, I need to go sit down for a couple of minutes. I, I got to go take a break for a few minutes. And here's the thing. You can do that without even asking for that. I have started, I, I bought myself an Apple Watch and it's got this breathing thing that it reminds me a few times a day. And I will, as soon as it buzzes, I stop what I'm doing and I take three minutes to do cal a calming breathing exercise and then go right back to work. And you want, no one even notices that I've done that because everybody else is doing their own stuff. That's the other thing too, is that I have learned that if you have a disability or you know someone with a disability, you are much more aware of other people and how they react to things than able-bodied people are. Able-bodied people just roll through the world and just bounce off of whatever and they don't even care. You know, they don't notice that they've upset somebody. And we need to have that attitude too because that's the right way to go. Because if I don't make a big deal out of it, chances are everybody else isn't going to either. And if they do, again, you know, you need to reevaluate where you're working. And I know that's a ridiculous thing to say in an economy where, you know, 3,000 people apply for two positions. But yes, our jobs are our lives, but our lives are still our lives. And if you are in an environment where you can't take five minutes to yourself, then my God, you don't want to work there anyway. They must be horrible to everybody, you know? And I've worked jobs like that. And it's somewhat comforting to know that they're treating everyone like crap. But at the same time, I'd much rather work at some place where they treat everyone really nicely. <laughs> And so, you know, modeling that behavior that we want to see and, you know, hopefully as we move into more management positions, it'll be easier for us to open the way for other people, but recognize that you may have to be that first person. And um, sometimes it's fun being the first. <laughs> um, Jasmine, do you have any thoughts on that? And before you answer, we are, I think this will be our last comment for the evening and then I will be reaching out to the panelists as we said to talk about whether or not or we will what to do with the chat questions. I'm very happy that we've had a lot of chat questions and thank you to all the participants for being here. So Jasmine any thoughts on that last question about navigating the workplace with an undisclosed um, or figuring out what diagnosis you may have? Um, actually, I really quickly wanted to, so I read the next question, I'm sorry, and I really oh, wanted ahead. to yeah. it because um, it's something I've been asked a lot lately, which is how do you deal with low back when you are, um, when you have to stop being civil? And uh, my response is the same, don't be civil from the beginning. Um, don't change your personality for anybody. You you need to come in assertive and, and, and maybe like if you believe in astrology, I'm an Aries, I stay ready. Like, I'm ready to fight you at all times. <laughs> um, but I think, and, when I, I and it's not about being an extrovert. It's about being, it's about being honest. Learn to be, be honest with yourself first and foremost. And when you're honest with yourself, figure out how to communicate that to others. Um, take the time to say, you know, I'm not comfortable with this or I'm not okay with what was said. Process it in your own time and then circle around in your own time. It doesn't matter when you say something, just say something um, and get into the habit of it and you'll find that you get faster and faster. So it's to say there's always, there's going to be blowback, but um, if you are living your authentic self, you, you cope with it better. You sleep better at night. You can cry it out in an hour and then you recover from it. And you never think about it again, but you have to believe that you will get to that point. You have to believe you'll get to the point where you're going to cry it out and then never think about it again. I sure don't. I, I'm going to cry it out. And then I'm like, I don't remember what happened last Tuesday. I'm sorry. I can't remember what happened like three hours ago. I have things to do. Um, so, um, 
my one up comment, right? My non Debbie Downer comment. <laughs> <laughs> and we appreciate it. Um, we do appreciate all of the panelists for taking time to be here with us today. And we appreciate the participants as well. Thank you. I believe that is the end of our event. Otherwise, not sure how to wrap it up. <laughs>